Well, it's time for... Back by popular demand, Dr. Robert M. Price is the Bible geek, answering your questions about the Bible and other religious texts. Welcome to the show. Okay, welcome to you folks. Welcome to me. Uh, and uh, welcome to everybody except Satan. Okay, uh, let's see here. What do we got? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Peter Rabbit. So how many types of commissions and to whom were there uh, that Jesus gave to his disciples, Peter and Paul? Uh, well, let's see. There is the Great Commission in uh, Matthew 28, uh, where he says, go into all the nations, uh, making disciples, baptizing them in my name or the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and uh, uh, teaching them to observe everything I commanded you, uh, which would include uh, every jot and tittle of the Torah, apparently. Uh, then there is the not-so-great commission in Matthew 10, where it says, don't go to any uh, uh, town of the Gentiles or the Samaritans or whatever, restrict your efforts to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then um, there is, um, well, it's not worded quite so uh, bluntly, but in Acts chapter 10, where Peter is told in the dream to uh, connect the dots and see that God considers all people uh, clean ritually and uh, nobody's off limits for the gospel. So he, and then when he gets to Cornelius, he kind of completes the thought and says, okay, I guess we've got to go to the Gentiles too. So that's sort of a commission. And uh, let's see, uh, uh, Paul, Barnabas, and others in the church at Antioch are commissioned by the church to uh, go out and preach to Gentiles, etc., which they do for the next few chapters. Then uh, in chapter 15, where they promulgate, don't you love that word? Uh, a friend of mine uh, used to pronounce it promulgulate, which somehow sounds better. But anyway, uh, uh, they were to propagate the apostolic decree to Gentile churches that they didn't have to keep the whole darn Torah. Uh, but a few ground rules would be pretty good to avoid needless offense to uh, Jews. Uh, let's see who else. Um, what do we got? Uh, um, well, uh, when Jesus is looking for recruits, he says, uh, you go and preach the kingdom of God. And uh, one guy says, uh, Gee, can I at least wait till my father dies so I can see to his burial? Another one says, uh, fine, let me just go say goodbye to my parents. And Jesus isn't having any of that. Things are too urgent. But he does seem to be sending people out there. Or John 4, uh, where the Samaritan woman's... Uh, telling everybody that Jesus must be a prophet and so on and so on. They should go see him for, for themselves because he's the savior of the world. And uh, as they're coming en masse, Jesus says, look at this. Um, uh, I, I am sending you out to uh, harvest what others have sown. So she did the work of evangelism, but uh, you are to, uh, I guess, catechize them or or whatever. It's like uh, counselors waiting at a Billy Graham rally, if you're old enough to remember that. Um, well, uh, when uh, Paul sees the vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus, he's commissioned to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, I guess that's probably pretty much it. Um, okay. Okay, um, and then there must have been other ones. I mean, anytime they ordained anybody, like in the pastoral epistles, they're talking about qualifications for bishops, deacons, and so forth. And uh, um, he meant, and in, uh, oh, I think it's, is it first or second Timothy? He says that the spirit was conveyed to Timothy by the laying on of hands. So he was commissioned to be a kind of, 
sub-apostle, you might say. So I guess that would count as well. No doubt. Oh, uh, well, they they seem to have commissioned the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6 to wait on tables and see to the distribution of food to the poor, especially to w widows. So um, they didn't just give them a job. They sort of sent them off like christening the ship with a champagne bottle. Uh, you've got a task now, and we're giving you the Holy Spirit uh, to enable you to do it. Uh, let me skip to uh, the third question by uh, Peter, because it uh, naturally follows from that one, and then I'll look at the, the one before it. Peter says, Acts increases the use of the Spirit to give a certain status, indeed. Uh, what exactly did it mean to receive the Spirit, and uh, how would one receive it? Did something similar occur in the Old Testament? Well, the normative way, apparently, by precedent or example, was the laying on of hands. Whether symbolically or somehow literally, uh, one would convey the Spirit to the person on whose uh, head or shoulders, whatever, uh, the apostolic hands were, were placed. And um, so what would happen then? Well, they would receive the Holy Spirit, and it usually says it's evident from some kind of linguistic behavior, some kind of speech. Usually uh, it's either boldness in preaching, uh, and um, I guess you could connect that with Jesus' promise that if you if you find yourself dragged before magistrates, uh, don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't get stage fright because the the Holy Spirit or Jesus Himself will give you irrefutable wisdom. Um, I suppose that's the same thing, but there's nobody on hand to uh, fill them with the Spirit. Uh, but I, I get the impression, well, yeah, from Acts, uh, once you have received it, and they didn't have the laying on of hands, right? Uh, they just were in the upper room at the time the Spirit descended en masse onto all of them, but the reception of it was marked by glossolalia, all 120 of them speaking in tongues, whether that was intended as foreign languages they hadn't learned, or um, ecstatic gibberish, uh, tongues of the angels, so to speak, hard to say, as you recall. Uh, in John chapter 20, what, which some, what Jesus is raised from the dead, and uh, he's got the disciples there, and it says he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. From now on, anybody who sins you remit, consider them remitted. But if you decide uh, to uh, retain their, their guilt, well, they're still stuck with it. It's up to you now. Uh, and in Matthew 16, there's a similar scene, though without any gesture, but he's, he does convey the authority to remit or forgive sins. Uh, he does the same with Peter a couple of chapters earlier. Again, no laying on of hands, but this commissioning. Uh, you are Peter, uh, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, whatever you... Uh, decide on earth, uh, it'll be rubber stamped in heaven. Uh, same sort of thing, uh, authority comes with it, or bold speech in evangelism, etc., or ecstatic speech, and, and or prophecy, which may be the same thing, actually. Um, in fact, that brings us to the Old Testament. Uh, the, it says with the prophets that the word of Yahweh came to them. It doesn't say necessarily they were filled with the Spirit, though it's easy to assume it means pretty much the same thing. And uh, with uh, Samson, his deeds of hu superhuman strength are the result of his um, of having the Spirit of Yahweh come upon him. And uh, he doesn't uh, have any inspired speech, but he has superhuman strength. The, um, the story about Saul, actually the two of them, uh, where Saul is told by Samuel to go to a certain place and he will find a traveling uh, band of what Wellhausen called Bacantes, like the... the uh, the women in uh, the Bacchae, and uh, 
and dervishes, I think he calls them. Well, that's pretty accurate, actually. He's borrowing from other religious traditions, but yeah, that's the idea. A band of people who um, either continually or frequently uh, felt the spirit uh, enter into them or, or uh, shower them or whatever, and they began to prophesy. And Saul um, uh, was sort of pulled into it at the sight of these people, uh, and uh, and he fell on the ground and into a trance and began to prophesy, which I have to think is just the Old Testament way of saying speaking in tongues. I mean, if they're all doing it at the same time, it's not addressed to anybody except God. Uh, I assume that's basically the same thing you see at the house of Cornelius or in the upper room. Uh, also, these guys in this band of prophets are said to have musical accompaniment that uh, apparently triggers the trance. In the same way that uh, young David would use his his lyre to uh, to exorcise the demon of it, of paranoia that had possessed Saul, it worked at least temporarily. This is sort of the other side of the coin. So, it might have been music. I don't believe there are cases of that mentioned in the New Testament, but it's the same sort of stuff, I guess. Uh, so, and one thing's for pretty darn sure, at least with biblical cases of it, just like the Pentecostals realized, when they started looking for a sign that you would receive the Holy Spirit, it had to be something noticeable. Like when uh, Peter and John lay hands on the Samaritan converts who had been baptized, but there were no apostles on hand to convey the Spirit, so... Uh, Pete and John came up from Jerusalem and they completed the process. Well, uh, something was impressive at the sight, right? Uh, Simon Magus says to Peter, gee, I, you know, I'd like to, I'll be willing to pay you to teach me how to do this. Uh, it's impressive. Well, you can tell it wasn't like a modern evangelical church where they say, okay, you've received the Holy Spirit, and you have to say it because there's no way you would know it otherwise. Uh, whereas with um, the Pentecostal churches, they expect there will be uh, audible uh, signs following, especially speaking in tongues, uh, and, and presumably in some kind of a, of a high, some sort of ecstatic experience. Uh, if there are, and, and uh, like there are loads of testimonies of this, and unless they're lying, uh, these people have been worked up to enter into an ecstatic uh, state of mind. Uh, and uh, that's pretty well documented. In uh, suburban charismatic church groups, you, you hear of people kind of being coached to speak in tongues. Well, that's ancient too, because Marcos the magician, uh, apparently a disciple of Simon Magus, uh, he was a Gnostic, and, and we're told by Irenaeus that he would teach people to speak in tongues, like say bata, and now say it real fast, and then, oh, bata, 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 you know, oh well, hallelujah, you got the spirit. Who am I to gainsay it? I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, there would be some evidence. Now, some folks would say, I reached a crisis point where I felt frustrated, so I prayed for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, Baptists and various others say, well, that's being born of the Spirit. It's all one package. But holiness and Pentecostal and charismatic Christians say, uh, no, this is a subsequent experience for empowerment and or sanctification, the second blessing. And um, uh, let's see, and, and if you don't feel the lightning bolt in the moment you pray for it, the assumption is that you will find your life changing. You'll be more heavenly minded, less addicted to material, trivial, temporal pursuits. It might be subtle, but supposedly you'll notice the difference. So, um, 
it, it's difficult to tell whether that really does the trick or, or if it's the uh, peer support in a close-knit charismatic group, the same way you depend upon the, the other uh, alcoholics in AA. Uh, it's a peer group that's mutually supportive, and that's why you got to keep going to the meetings. It's like if you remove a log from the fire, it's uh, going to go out on that log, and it'll eventually cool down. You need to stay in the uh, in the uh, the uh, log pile on on uh, on fire. Okay. Oh. Boy, there's a lot of questions that come in since I've been uh, shooting my mouth off. Uh, let me get back to the one I uh, skipped temporarily. Hmm. This is it, I think. Yeah. Um, Peter says... Uh, I'm starting to believe the Gospels, Acts, and Epistles were written by various factions, similar to our current political parties. Am I off on that? No, you are exactly right. Ernst Kesemann, I mentioned this before, but let me remind you, the World Council of Churches asked Kesemann, who was a prominent disciple of Bultmann, I, I love uh, Kesemann's uh, essays, uh, they asked him to write something about the New Testament and the unity of the church because the ecumenical movement was real big there in the late 50s, early 60s, and so on. How can we get together? How can we have greater unity? Maybe even merge the denominations. Yeah, that didn't work. Probably a bad idea anyway. Um, and uh, he said, okay, I'll take the challenge. And then he uh, did his study and then reported back, you know, I uh, can't do this because it, the New Testament points in the opposite direction. Their clashes between the various documents and their authors, they didn't agree. Uh, and that's where you get debates between the churches. Each can point to a passage um, on the debated subject that uh, mandates their side, infant baptism versus believer's baptism. You don't have to cheat to point to a passage that'll authenticate either one, free will or predestination, same thing. Uh, and so on and so on, a universal salvation or some go to heaven, some go to hell. I can tell you passages to quote on either side of that. Uh, can women preach and prophesy? Yes, over here, no over there. Do Christians keep the Torah? Yes versus no. And he said there's, there's no way to make the uh, New Testament canon a charter for ch church unity. It's just the opposite. So what you have to do, Kazaman said, and this really opens a can of worms, he said you have to learn to discern the spirits even within the canon of the written New Testament, uh, which is more subjective than, than most uh, theologians want to be, right? They would like to be able to cite chapter and verse, and that's the end of it, but you just can't do it. And that's why people... Uh, do these uh, pathetic self-deceptions like, well, you uh, have an apparent contradiction here, but uh, you need to just interpret the less clear passages, namely the ones you don't like, uh, uh, in light of the more clear passages, the ones you do like. So basically, you're just uh, saying I'm writing off the one that doesn't agree with me. And what, what does it actually think you're doing here? I mean, is it, uh, let's have a seance and uh, call up the spirit of Paul. And, and well, no, uh, Paul and James. Uh, hey, gents, uh, you seem to differ in the Bible as to what it is that is saving. Uh, is it, is it uh, faith and works or just faith? Uh, what's the deal? And uh, they, they kind of expect, if you could do that, James would say, you know, Paul is right. 
I, I never should have put it the way I did in my epistle. I've always regretted it. Uh, and uh, it, it was a poor choice of words. Okay, thanks, Jim. That's what I figured. Right. So you'll, you'll resort to a less literal interpretation and pretend that it really means what your favorite passage uh, says. That is one of the greatest pathetic tricks of apologetics, and there are many. Yeah, all oh, right. Um, Peter, I bet you thought I was going to forget that, but no. GSR saith, if approximately one-third of humans are Christian, that means the majority of human beings were not or are not Christian and are thus unsaved. Why would God's plan for salvation ignore most people? Well, a conservative would probably say it doesn't. That's why it says get your butt out there and spread the gospel uh, through the whole creation uh, to every nation and so on. And so missionaries uh, would get busy. And they made amazing progress, if you want to call it that, in the 19th century, where missionaries were going to all different countries all over the world learning languages at great uh, effort and expense and then uh, living in the, the crudest uh, primitive conditions and so on in order to uh, present Christianity. And uh, they did have great success. There, there's like millions and zillions of Christians in Korea and sub-Saharan Africa and so on and so on. Uh, but it, it's true that uh, nobody's ever really covered the globe, like uh, Jeremiah says, um, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Uh, that's never happened. So as someone asked, I think last night, what about all the poor schmucks that never have the chance to hear about the saving uh, option of, of faith in Christ? Well, there's all kinds of theories some of them not really implausible, like Karl Rahner, uh, Ramondo uh, Panikar, and uh, oh, various uh, who, who say that uh, God will some if God sees the yearning of your heart for righteousness and salvation, he'll make sure somebody gets to you with the gospel. That seems a little iffy to me. I mean, there's no way to verify it. It sounds a little too neat and simple. Uh, others say, well, uh, like Karl Rahner, the anonymous Christian theory, that if their heart is right and they are seeking what Christ offers, even though they've never heard of Christ, uh, God considers them saved anyhow. If you're just some arrogant jerk who thinks the world revolves around you and uh, you got nothing to worry about, you're pretty great. Uh, I'd start worrying uh, because whether you, you you don't have to hear of Jesus and reject him to be damned. Uh, that kind of self-sufficient um, arrogance is what alienates one from God because one is making oneself into God. This is at least you know, what, what the theory is. It's, it's not unreasonable, but who knows. Um, then Panikar's view that your religion, your non-Christian religion, Buddhism, shamanism, whatever the heck it is, if, it, if you are sincere and a true seeker, uh, Christ will work through the sacraments and rituals of your religion, whatever it is, to save you. So you don't know the name of Jesus, but the spirit of Jesus is present and uh, you will be saved. Um, Billy Graham always used to say, look, I, you, you got me stumped. I don't know the mind of God on this or an infinite number of other things, but I'm sure God being just, he'll be just in this case. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Abraham asks. Sure, I don't know what it'll be, but, you know, I'm not in charge of it. I'm sure God will do whatever the righteous thing is. Eh, not a bad answer. Um, 
uh, there were Calvinists in the 19th century who resisted the great missionary enterprise and said, look, uh, if God has predestined people to be saved, they're going to be saved. He doesn't need your puny efforts, your bungling attempts at evangelism. Well, uh, how do you figure he's going to do it? Uh, angels coming down with their little evangelistic leaflets? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, so they're, uh, but the, the basic instinct is, yeah, we got to cover the ground. God does want everybody to hear about this. Of course, this was easier to say when you didn't realize how big the world was. Uh, but um, the the idea is its, it's scope is universal and it is sufficiently comprehensive to save everybody depending on how they react to it. Unless God's big surprise is that Jesus died for the whole human race and it worked. Go wake up in heaven one day. Okay. Um, uh, three things. Fishing. Do you think the early Christian church attempted to censor or destroy the Q document? No, I think that uh, I think that it very likely that there was a Q document and that the reason it perished was virtually all of it was included between uh, Matthew and Luke. And so they figure, well, we, we really got it there. Uh, why bother making copies of, of the original. Um, now, you could say the same thing about Mark, because almost all of it appears again in Matthew and most of it in Luke. So why bother copying that? Well, uh, there's reason to think that Mark was was the Roman gospel. It was written there and uh, that they figured, given the status and the clout of Rome, uh, we better not let their special favorite gospel parish. Let, let's keep copying that one. But Q, yeah, who knows who compiled it or whatever. And we, we got it anyway between the two uh, later gospels. So I don't think anybody found anything wrong with it. Uh, they just figured it's superfluous effort to keep making copies of it. Um, oh... Uh, three things fishing similarly asks do you think the early oh no that's the wrong one do you think the early no oh, wait a second uh, it is another one from him but he says is it possible to reconstruct the gospel of the hebrews yeah you can make a stab at it and i did in my pre-nicene new testament and the way you do it is uh to collect all the citations of it by church fathers who did have copies of it to look at and it becomes immediately clear that this was another version of the gospel of matthew it had a few extras in it 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 omitted or lacked certain things that were in matthew but on the whole it was basically another version of it and there were another there were other versions too the gospel according to the ebionites the gospel according to the nazarenes uh they were probably just different editions of the gospel according to the hebrews uh but um the the church fathers who had it uh, were interested in comparing it with the other Gospels. And so lucky for us, uh, Tertullian and others have long treatments of it where they say, oh, what do you know? Uh, the Gospel of the Hebrews puts this a little bit differently. For instance, uh, there was a version of the story of the woman taken in adultery. You know, let him who was without sin cast the first stone. So, but instead of adultery, in the Gospel of the Hebrews, it just says she was guilty of many sins. Hmm. Or uh, another one, uh, the rich young ruler. They say, hey, isn't it interesting that in the Gospel according to the Hebrews, uh, when uh, Jesus, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, oh, you know, the commandments, right? Uh, and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, love your neighbors yourself. And uh, Jesus says to him, well, I don't think you're doing such a great job of that, my friend, because your house is filled with opulent uh, goodies and not a bit of it goes out to your poor uh, uh, 
fellow Jews who are clad in filth and don't have enough to eat. Oh, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's pretty interesting. And there, there are various alternate versions and so on. I assume we probably have most of them covered, given the the uh, the specificity and the comprehensiveness with which the church fathers uh, recounted the differences. So we can kind. Of, it was a bit shorter than Matthew, also, but uh, we have a pretty good idea of what was in it. I'd say, and um, there are various. Uh, Oh, a lot of that stuff is in oh uh, the apocryphal New Testament, uh, especially the later uh, version of it by J.K. Eliot. Uh, it's probably more comprehensive and in more modern English than M.R. James's um, book of the same title, the apocryphal New Testament. I got them both. Uh, they're both great. Uh, so you can actually, or you can look at my uh, pre-Nicene New Testament uh, nobody's sure we've got the whole thing, but it's not like Papias's oracles of, of our Lord. Boy, I wish we had that because there's almost uh, nothing that survives. Um, let me let you think about that while I let my cat out. I'm the only human in the house and he's going to be clawing me and making a nuisance of himself until I do. I'll be right back. Okay, buddy. Now let's go. Uh, there is no truth to the rumor that the movie That Darn Cat was based on my cat Merlin, but uh, I can see how you can make that mistake. Anyway, uh, yeah, so gospel according to the Hebrews. Now, what's next? Peter, quick follow-up. So receiving the Spirit was not connected to baptism? Well, uh, sometimes it was, but, the, uh, but it happens before baptism in... Uh, the Cornelius story, because it has to, right? He needs to see the reception of the Spirit to know that, yeah, these people uh, can receive the gospel and be baptized. So, uh, you know, if, if there were no display of the Spirit, we, for all we know, we could have just gone through a charade. Um, and in the case of the Samaritans, uh, they're, they're baptized, but don't receive the Spirit until uh, some days later when Peter and John get there, because the point of that one is to show everything has to be done under the supervision of the Jerusalem apostles. It's not, you can't come up with a, an exact consistent formula for this because it varies in acts with what the writer's trying to prove. Uh, let's see. Uh, but apparently, yeah, baptism ordinarily does convey the spirit as part of the the symbolism of your dying and rising with Christ in, in the water of baptism. And that just as he received the spirit as soon as he got out of the drink, um, so would you. So that's, uh, there is a connection. It's just not invariable uh, in, in the Bible anyway. Uh, Ravum says Tertullian writes that Marcion inserted docetic teachings into a bastardized version of Luke. Is there any evidence of which view was first? Well, Tertullian is honest enough to tell us that though he and others 
claim Marcion cut stuff out that didn't agree with his theology, uh, that he said, I, of course, Marcion says just the opposite about us, us Catholics, whatever you want to call them, uh, that w we have added stuff in to fit our theology. And he doesn't say how you'd prove it one way or the other, but he actually admits that uh, you got both sides uh, accusing the other of tampering uh, with it. Uh, and um, I think Marcion's was first because I go along with Marcus Vincent's uh, fascinating and I think compelling argument that the first narrative gospel was composed by Marcion in the second century. There hadn't been any, none are quoted before then. An occasional saying that looks kind of like something in the gospel appears in this or that church father. Uh, but um, no stories are alluded to until the gospels are actually uh, attested in the second century. Uh, and... Um, so um, Marcus Vincent says Marcion must have written the first gospel, preserving what he liked of the Old Testament narratives by rewriting them as Jesus stories, taking an Elijah story and making it into a Jesus story with certain changes, an Elisha story, now it becomes a Jesus story, a Moses story, a Joshua story. Uh, and uh, boy, you, you can really see that uh, when you compare the gospel stories with what look like Old Testament prototypes. So he wrote this and he had a school of disciples. Uh, he had classes like a seminar and a lot of uh, philosophers and uh, really, uh theologians did in the second century in Rome. Uh, and um, so that he had these students and he made copies of his gospel. And, and, and it's no doubt it said at the top, not for circulation. He told them, look, this is not to be published. I may publish it later, but this is a draft, but I want to get your reactions and we'll discuss it. Well, uh, nobody had ever seen this before. And his students said, wow, this is great stuff. Imagine reading the Gospels for the first time. And he said, I know he said not to share it, but I, I can't keep the lid on this. I got to show this to so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. so immediately they did. And it wasn't long before it was circulating all over the place. And people said, well, this is good, but boy, I, I would change this or that. Or it doesn't really deal enough with this. Uh, let's uh, add something to that effect. And so there were immediately pirate editions, which would include Matt, canonical Luke, Matthew, John, um, and uh, Mark. And once uh, once Marcion was shown some of these, he said, oh, brother, this is what I was afraid of. And he said, well, now I got to publish my own definitive edition of it. And apparently he, he did look at the various uh, ripoffs of it and said, well, some of this material is not bad. I, I think I will include some of this in the definitive version. And that's the one that the Marcionite church used. And that's the one that Tertullian and others are comparing to uh, what they didn't realize were pirate editions of, uh, of, of Marcion's gospel. Uh, as, uh, that's a new theory, but I find it very convincing. Marcus with a K, Vincent with a Z instead of a C. Uh, great, great book. This guy writes, he's like um, M. David Litwa, both of them. Uh, are geniuses and uh, come up with, uh, they, they've got x-ray vision into the text and point out stuff I never thought of and apparently nobody else. Uh, what does Poe say in The Raven? Dreaming dreams no mortal ever dreamt before. Not bad, guys. Okay. Um. Who's up at bat next? It's Grandpong. 
uh, he answers Peter Rabbit saying, my current take is that baptized in the spirit was Jesus being a rogue anointer using the temple anointment oil outside the temple and priestly control. That's well, speculative. I don't know that we ever see anything like that happen, really. Um, I mean, the only time we see Jesus doing some gesture that conveys the spirit, he just breathes on him. But who knows? Uh, John D. Uh, says, The spirit of God is similar to a comet's tail for people who didn't know better. Um, you know, uh, Bruce J. Molina in his terrific book, why do I always say, oh, this guy's great book, this guy's terrific book? Well, because they're the ones that have stuff I want to convey. And there's a lot of great stuff out there. Okay. Uh, uh, Molina uh, deals with the astronomical imagery in the book of Revelation with reference to a whole lot of ancient astrology handbooks uh, that survived to this day. And uh, it, Revelation is obviously like a dream or a vision. And uh, uh, it has uh, various things that uh, comets and so forth. And he says, he shows you what these things refer to and that a lot of it is just fireworks in the sky. Um, but I don't want to get off on that. That's uh, way uh, off. I just, I'm just going to recommend the book. Um the genre and message of the book of Revelation. Uh, Z. Stallone, what are the most historically possible events of the Bible? I would say the least interesting late ones in the Old Testament, uh, where no supernaturalism is involved. There are wars and conquests and deportations and stuff like that uh, that we read about in the Deuteronomic history and in the Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah. Some of that stuff is uh, apparently real history because there are glancing references to some of those people in non-biblical materials. Uh, but uh, all the really good stuff that they make movies about, uh, that's way back there in the uh, the Library of Old Testament Mythology. Uh, the New Testament, that is really hard to say because uh, there are a few attested historical figures there. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, um, Caiaphas the High Priest, uh, Pontius Pilate. But the problem is the things said about these figures are so uncharacteristic of them that you get the impression it's the same sort of thing you find in the Greco-Roman novels, which often feature real historical figures, but like in a, you know, a spurious historical drama on TV. Uh, and was George Washington really gay? Is that? No, I was just making stuff up about him. Um, so there, there's not much of any real historical um, fact uh, in, in the Bible, and not even the exodus from Egypt. I mean, there's really no way that happened. Uh, the, you got to rethink even the Babylonian exile. Who actually was taken away? All of Israel and Judah? No. We hear that all the time, but it doesn't say that. Just the, uh, the uh, aristocracy and the priesthood and so forth. And, oh, so the... Uh, how about the second coming of Christ? That's supposed to have been uh, uh, something happening in the first century. I got news for you. Looked at the calendar lately. No go. And uh, so I think you're uh, you're dealing with in inspired, like Shakespeare was, inspired fiction of a spiritual nature and well worth reading and pondering, um, both for discerning the signs of the times Gee, you know, what we're seeing now, uh, you got to take the vaccine. Boy, that reminds me of having to take the mark of the beast. It doesn't mean that that was, uh, uh, that, that 
taken the COVID vaccine was actually what was being foretold clairvoyantly by the author of Revelation. It just means this is a uh, similar sort of a situation. Uh, maybe I should be suspicious of it and refuse to take it, even if I get fired. Who knows what's going on? I mean, having the analogy makes you think, wait a minute, what is really going on here? Uh, that's pretty valuable. Um, whether there's going to be any literal 666 stamped on your head or your hand uh, or, or uh, what Jesus says, does it really matter? I mean, if it, if it sears your conscience and you think, wow, yes, I, I, I must repent and so on. Does it matter who said it? Uh, so anyway. I'm a big fan of the Bible, though I don't think hardly any of it is historical, but to me that's irrelevant. Ah, let's see. Robham says, Dr. Price confirms George Washington was gay. Well, that's how legends grow, right? Of course, I didn't say that. Uh, Welsh backgammon says, Hi, Dr. Bob, are there any modern-day apologists that you genuinely respect? I asked the same question to... Pine Creek Doug, and he nominated Peter Enns. If I'm thinking of the wrong, uh, of the right guy, he is uh, trying to rehabilitate Genesis scientifically. And again, I may be mistaken, but I read uh, a book of his that struck me as uh, pretty desperate. Uh, I uh, sort of admire what he, he was trying to do, but I uh, I think the whole thing is axe grinding, as Richard Tierney used to say, grinding the axe of the apostles. Uh, there, there's a kind of basic intellectual dishonesty to it. You're starting out with a belief that you embraced long ago, probably on emotional grounds or family loyalty or something. And now you're looking for arguments to make it seem objectively true. You could come up with something. Uh, it's possible, but with a motive like that, it's not surprising that a lot of the arguments they feel seem really to be rationalizations. Now, there's some that that I respect as individuals, Michael Green, Bob Siegel, Greg Boyd, Gary Habermas, I think highly of all of them, uh, but I, uh, and others, but I, I just can't really believe that they're uh, just starting trying to find out what is true. No, they, they got it decided uh, beforehand what they think is true and what kind of a case can I make, like a defense attorney? Uh, so uh, that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't evaluate their arguments because it uh, shouldn't. Uh, yeah, that's right. You, you need to evaluate the arguments they offer. They could be valid no matter what motivated uh, the, the apologist to accept them. Because if you say, well, look, this guy's got a, a dog in this race, I can safely ignore him. Uh, no, no, you can't. That's the uh, the uh, ad hominem or the genetic fallacy. I get them mixed up. Uh, it doesn't matter where it came from. You need to evaluate any argument on its own merits insofar as you can. Okay. Well, believe it or not, I think that's uh, it for uh, tonight's questions. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is there another one here? Nope, nope, that's the one I just did. Okay, well, I'll get back to working on all Gnosis comics, and I'll see you tomorrow at 4 for... Uh, Gnostic Sabbath, and I think I don't hold me to it now, but I, I'm thinking I'm going to try to do a, a sort of a review, an explanation of the Gospel of Truth by the great Valentinus. But it'll be interesting, whatever it is. So I'll see you then. Okay.
Hmm. I don't know. 